Hi guys, today we are starting with the finance MCQ 5 question series. So these questions will be comprised of the current finance questions as well as the static finance questions. These questions will be really interesting for you and these are really important for your examination. So do watch the video till end to have some knowledge of finance MCQs. The question is IIP growth of 4.3% in July 2019 has moved against the trend of economic slowdown. IIP has been divided on the basis of different sectors. Which sector has the lowest weightage while calculating the composite index? And there are four options that are given to you for answering the question. Before answering the question, let us first understand what are the different types of indices and then we move forward to understand that what IIP is and on what basis is this IIP differentiated. So moving forward, here the concept is really important for you to understand. Here we are going to understand what are the different types of indices based on the production point of view and based on the inflation point of view. So these are the list of five indices that I have made for you and we'll be discussing in brief that what these indices calculate and who publishes these indices. So the first one is from the production point of view, the first is PMI and what PMI is? that is the purchasing managers index. It is an economic indicator that surveys the purchasing managers at businesses that make up a given sector. Note here that it is a survey. So this index is based upon a survey and two indices are there, one for the manufacturing sector and another for the services sector. The another one is IIP and IIP is the index of industrial production. It is a composite indicator and it measures the changes in the volume of production. So note the word here, volume of production. Suppose in a particular month, say in the month of June, the production of cars is 50 units and in the next month, that is July, the production increases to 60 units. So there is a rise by 20%. So based on the volume of production, this index is calculated. And we are going to discuss this index in detail in the next slide. Now coming on to the inflation point of view indices, the first one is CPI. And you all must be knowing what CPI is, that is consumer price index. It is on the consumer level as the name suggests. And suppose if you go to a market, and you buy a basket of goods for say 20 rupees and now after a certain time period if that basket of goods price rises to 30 rupees then this difference in the price will be comprised in calculation of CPI. The next one is WPI. WPI is the wholesaler price index and it is on the wholesaler level. The third one is PPI which is producer price index and it measures the average changes in the prices of goods and services as they leave the place of production. Now we shall be discussing a very important topic here that is who publishes these indexes. The first one is PMI. So PMI is published by IHS market limited. The second is IIP and it is published by CSO and what CSO is? That is Central Statistical Organization. The third is the third is CPI and it is published by again CSO. The fourth one is WPI and it is published by the Economic Advisor. I will be writing it as EA from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. The fifth one is PPI and it is published by Bureau of Labor Statistics. Do remember that who publishes these indices because one question could be there in your examination related to this topic. Now let's move forward and understand that what is IIP. The IIP is that indicator that measures the level of industrial activity as we have already discussed that it takes into consideration the volume of production in the economy. And we have also discussed the publishing organization for the same that is CSO, Central Statistical Organization. Now the next concept that we are going to discuss is 
about the sectoral composition of IIP and from this part the question have been asked here. So three sectors are considered for calculating IIP. The first one is manufacturing, second is mining and third is electricity. Manufacturing comprises of 77.6 percentage weightage, mining is for 14.37 and electricity has the lowest weightage while calculating the IIP that is 7.99. Now this is the sectoral composition of IIP. IIP is also classified on the basis of uses. Now one additional information for you guys is that the base year was changed from 2004-05 to 11-12 in 17 and on 12th May 2017 was the recent changes that have been made in IIP. Now moving back to the question, the question was that which sector has the lowest weightage while calculating the composite index. So the A part is services and we know that services is not a part while calculating the composite index. Services is a part in PMI but not IIP. Electricity for which the weightage was around 7.99%. Manufacturing for which the weightage was 77.63% and mining for which the weightage was 1437 So our answer will be option B that is electricity. And remember that we have also discussed that besides the main classification of the index based on these three sectors, IIP is also prepared on use-based classification. And there are six use-based sectors for which IIP is calculated. And these six sectors are mentioned here. So do give a look here and make your concepts much clearer. I hope that you have understood the concept of IIP, its classifications and different types of indices which is a very important topic and one question could be asked from the indices part. Now moving on to the next question. The question here says government is planning to extend the credit enhancement fund to the borrowers for a boost in housing sector. What is the appropriate term used for such a practice of lending to borrowers who were ineligible for taking the loans earlier? So again, four options are given to you. Before answering the question, let me tell you that I have picked this news from a leading newspaper and we shall be discussing this news. But before discussing this news, we need to understand the terminology of these four concepts. Moving forward to understand the terms, the first one is overdraft. Now, now you must have heard the term overdraft when you go to a bank. For example, you go to a bank and you ask the bank to give you an overdraft against your current account and every current account have some sort of limit attached to it for giving the overdraft. The second term is collateral based lending. Now a collateral based loan is one where based on some asset you get the loan. For example, if you go to a bank and you keep your jewelry or suppose any of the asset with the bank and against that asset which acts as a collateral, you get the loan. In case you are unable to repay the loan back, the bank keeps your asset with itself. So this is what collateral based lending is. The next term is a guaranteed loan. Now what a guaranteed loan means? As the name suggests, there is some sort of guarantee involved in this. So when a third party and this third party could even be a government agency. So when a third party guarantees that so and so person would repay the loan and if he will not repay the loan then I am responsible for his debt. So this case will be termed as a guaranteed loan. And the last is subprime lending and this is one of the very important terms used in finance and it has a really important mark in the histories of crisis. So we shall be discussing this now. Subprime lending means to lend to such a person who is having a bad credit history and there is no guarantee by the third party. So while lending the bank in order to safeguard themselves, they hike the interest rates with respect to the default premium. So one of the reasons for financial crisis in 2008 in US was the subprime loan. Now after understanding these four terminologies, let's move back to our question and after answering the question, 
we shall be discussing the news now the question was that government is planning to extend credit enhancement fund to such borrowers who were earlier ineligible for taking the loan so what will be the most appropriate term that could be used here so the answer is guarantee based lending now you must be wondering that why not subprime lending because subprime lending involves those borrowers with the bad credit histories so the answer is that in subprime lending no guarantees are given whereas in the guarantee based lending a third party that can even be a government agency gives some sort of guarantee to the banks for lending to those ineligible borrowers now after answering the question let's move on to this news we all know that Indian economy is facing a serious slowdown and housing sector have a great hit listen to me here carefully because we are now going to discuss the current affair for the finance now we all know that housing sector is not doing well and this fund that is the credit enhancement fund is part of a package that the government is preparing to revive the housing sector now we shall be discussing the target group for this fund and what credit enhancement fund impacted the target group is those borrowers with a bad credit history who used to avail loans from the informal sector at a very high cost but now with this fund they only need to spend a small fee to avail the facilities of this fund and now they could easily borrow from the formal sector so what will be the impact of this that now banks will be more comfortable in lending to such borrowers beca because of the guarantee which the government is offering and because of this fund more buyers for homes will be there which means the demand for houses will increase the number of unsold homes and the stalled project would go down and because of the improvement in the housing sector its ancillary sectors will also improve the other related sectors like cement steel and as a result there will be a boost in the growth now i hope that you have understood this credit enhancement fund and the four terminologies that we have discussed in this section moving forward to the third question the third question says developed countries like japan germany have moved their economies to a negative interest rate territory notice the word negative interest rate now what is the motive behind any country's decision to opt for negative interest rates now before answering this question let us first understand that what negative interest rates is because some of us are really confused now also that what is the meaning of negative interest rates and how does it work and what is the motive behind any country's central bank to reduce its interest rate to such a level so as to bring it to a negative interest rate territory i have compiled the concept of negative interest rates for you guys in one ppt so do pay the attention here because this concept is really important and many central banks are moving towards the negative interest rates territory so this becomes one of the hot topics also and as the student of finance you must know that what negative interest rates means let us first look at the meaning of the negative interest rates we all know that when we go to a bank to keep our funds as deposits with it we get the interest rates on it but during the time of negative interest rates the opposite happens that is if you go to a bank to keep your deposits then you have to pay the interest to the banks in order to keep your deposits safe isn't it interesting and weird but this is what negative interest rates means now you must be thinking that if a depositor has to pay the interest to the banks for keeping his deposits safe then what is the need for a central bank to reduce its interest rate to such a level so now we are going to discuss the purpose for the same the purpose is to incentivize the banks to lend freely now how does this happen we all know as per the requirements banks have to keep some of their reserves with the central bank and when the economy is going down none of the banks want to lend just because of the default risk so it tries to keep more of the funds as reserves with the central bank but when the negative interest rates are there bank have to pay the interest rates on them as well 
like we depositors have to pay the interest rate to the bank so banks tend to withdraw their excessive reserves from the central bank and those reserves could then be utilized for lending it is forcing the banks in a way to withdraw their excessive reserve to lend freely and the second one is to spur the investment because as a depositor why would i pay the interest on the money that i am keeping with the bank so instead i would rather withdraw my funds from the banks and i would make the investments from my funds so that will boost the mechanism of investment and thereby growth in the economy and do not forget that a central bank opts for the negative interest rate when the economy is going down now one more thing that i want to discuss here with you is that some of you must have thought that when there are negative interest rates so as depositors we need to give interest rate to the banks then what happens with the lending amount in other words what i am trying to say is suppose there is a bank and if a bank is lending then whether the bank has to give the interest rate to the borrower or not so this is one of a very interesting question under the negative interest rate so let me make it clear for you guys that even in the negative interest rates the interest rates on loans are nearly around 0% like 0.5 0.2% so as a result the banks does not have to pay the borrowers on account of the negative interest rates the first option says to disincentivize the foreign investors from holding a significant proportion of ownership in the country's stock market so let's spend some time to discuss this option why would any country want to dissuade its foreign investors from investing in its stock market so this is not the correct option the second one is to make the banking system of the country strong as they will be getting interest from the depositors but do not forget that banks also have to give the interest on the reserves that it keeps with the central bank so this option is also not correct because with the negative interest rates the banking system is not becoming strong the third reason is to significantly reduce the inflation in the country now do not forget that interest rates and inflation are negatively related to each other so when interest rates goes down inflation goes up so this statement is conceptually wrong the fourth option is to spur the investment in the country and thereby stimulating the economy so this is the correct answer for this question because in the event of economic slowdown economic recession negative interest rate territory plays a role to for the investment and growth in the economy so this is one of the conceptual question that i've asked to you guys i hope that you have understood the concept of negative interest rates because the next question that follows is also related to the negative interest rates but that is really interesting as we will see the fourth question here is the central bank of which of the following countries has never reduced its interest rates below 0% that is the question is asking you that which of the countries have never introduced negative interest rate in its economy maybe this question seems to be very basic to you guys but let me tell you that the country which is the answer to this question is planning to move to the negative interest rate territory so this is where this question becomes really important and interesting now moving here bank of japan has introduced the negative interest rates in 2016 european central bank in 2014 and presently its interest rate is minus 0.5% and earlier it was minus 0.4% which is shown here in the graph also now for switzerland it followed the european central bank at around 2014 it also introduced a negative interest rate so our answer is the united states of america and donald trump is planning to move to the negative interest rates now the next question and the last question of this video is that during the economic slowdown central banks may resort to conventional as well as unconventional policy to stimulate the economy which of the following is a type of unconventional policy that may be used by the countries to revive 
growth. Now, before moving on to the options, let us first understand that what conventional and unconventional policy means. Because some of you still not might be knowing that what conventional and unconventional policies are. So do not worry because we are discussing the concept behind this in the next slide. To answer this question in a better way. So there are two types of policies. The first is conventional policy and the next is unconventional policy. Conventional policy is a set of instruments which is available to a central bank to control the money supply. Note the word here during the regular course. So whenever a central bank wants to control its money supply or inflation then it might resort to the conventional policies first and now we are going to discuss the instruments of conventional policy the first is the liquidity adjustment facility it includes the repo and the reverse repo rate repo rate is the rate at which a central bank lends to the bank and reverse repo rate is the rate at which banks lends to the central bank the next is OMOs OMOs is the open market operations and we are going to discuss this in detail in the next slide. MSS is market stabilization scheme and it is a monetary policy intervention by the RBI to withdraw the excess liquidity or money supply by selling the government securities in the economy. So one of the important things here to notice that in MSS this is one way and by one way I mean that RBI sells the government securities to suck the liquidity out of the economy. And the next is CRR and SLR. They are the reserve requirements. Moving on to the unconventional policy. When the conventional policy becomes ineffective, particularly the OMO becomes ineffective, central bank resorts to the unconventional policy and quantitative easing is a way to implement the unconventional policy. Now we are going to discuss quantitative easing in the next slide and we are going to compare OMOs, MSS and QE also. So open market operation means buying and selling of T-bills in the open market. Here two-way transactions is there by the RBI that is they can either buy or they can sell the T-bills in the open market depending upon their objective to meet the inflation and the policy rate target. So suppose there is excess money supply in the economy and with excess money supply there is inflation in the economy. Now the RBI wants to reduce its inflation to meet its target. So what RBI do is RBI will sell the government securities in the market so that people will buy the T-bills in exchange of money and as a result money supply will go down and thereby the inflation will go down meeting the policy needs of the government. So do notice that two way is there buying and selling of T-bills depending upon the objective. Now discussing the quantitative easing, do note here that a central bank only purchases. So it is again one way. So a central bank purchases government securities and other securities from the market. And the purpose is to increase the money supply in the economy. Now in the previous slide, I have discussed MSS with you guys. MSS was market stabilization scheme and there also I told you that it is one way. So how MSS and QE are differentiated from each other? In QE, it is one way with respect to the purchase of government securities. While in MSS, it is one way by way of selling the government security. I hope that I have made myself clear while explaining the terms and different kind of policies used by the government. Now, in order to answer this question, let us look at the options given. The first one is reducing interest rates through repo rate. So we have discussed that this is a part of conventional policy. Second is open market operations. This is also a conventional policy instrument. Third is quantitative easing, which we have discussed under the unconventional policy. So our answer is option C. And the last one is specifying reserve requirements for banks. So this also we have discussed under the conventional policy. With this, we have completed five questions on finance. And if you are finding any difficulty in understanding any of the concepts, 
then do ask your queries in the comment section and I assure you that I will be answering them. Do subscribe to our channel for related videos. If you like my video, then do hit the bell icon. Thank you. That's all for today.